So I'm going to put up a picture here on the screen. Uh, maybe you recognize the guy on the left, your right. He's, uh, he's an actor by the name of Josh Brolin. He portrayed the guy on his right, your left. That other guy that no one knows, his name is Beck Weathers. And way back in 1996, Beck Weathers was a part of a team, along with a number of other people, that were climbing Mount Everest. In fact, there were two large groups or teams of people climbing Mount Everest on a very fateful day back in 1996 when this freakish, wicked storm came up, trapping uh, a number of these people as they were reaching the summit and then coming down. They pushed their luck. They were on the mountain too late in the day. The storm came up. And as it turns out, eight of those climbers died that day on the face of Everest. Beck Weathers was not one that died, but he really easily could have been one. In fact, he was left for dead. Now, if you saw the movie Everest uh, two, three years ago now, did a great job of portraying what they went through and even what Beck went through. If you've seen it, maybe you remember uh, he's huddled up, curled up uh, out in the snow and the, the blizzard blowing past and and one of, the, one of the rules is, you know, somebody drops at that altitude, you leave them. Because if you try to save them, guess what? You're both dead. So he was left. And other climbers, as they were coming down, they just walked right past him. And it looked like he was dead. In fact, for every uh, you know, possible reason, he, you know, there's no way he was going to survive. But a miracle happened. I call it miracle. I don't use that word lightly or loosely. For whatever reason, he woke up, came to his senses, and he was already snow blind because of the, the blizzard and the cold temperatures. He could not see where he was going, but he, he came to his senses already suffering from severe frostbite, and he gets up, and they portray the movie. He gets up, and he begins stumbling out into the blizzard to try to find their base camp. At any moment, he could have fallen and perished. But somehow, he wanders through the blizzard back to their base camp, much to the astonishment of everyone that was there. He found his way back without being able to see. He would have liked to have seen, I'm sure, but he couldn't. This morning, we're going to talk about seeing when you can't see. I love, love, love the passage that we're in. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Mark chapter 10, and we're going to get into this morning what Mark presents to us at the end of the story. Uh, so uh, if you haven't been with us, Mark has been presenting really what it means to be alive in Christ. And we're coming to the end of chapter 10 now that Chapter 11 brings us into what many people call the triumphant entry. Uh, usually we get into this chapter on Palm Sunday. We're not quite there yet. I'm off the calendar a little bit. But anyway, that's the triumphal entry. So this whole journey that we've been on with Jesus and the disciples has been leading up to this climax, this, this few moments, these few days before Jesus and the disciples enter into Jerusalem. If you know the story, the palm leaves come out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, remember that? That's chapter 11. Everything has been leading up to that point as Jesus is giving his last teaching before the Passion Week. So this is huge. And this last teaching has everything to do about his last, Jesus' last words to the disciples about what it truly means to have life in him. So let's get the context here, starting at verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days, he will rise. This is the third of three times here in this last or later part of the book where Jesus says clearly, where Mark records 
uh, saying that Jesus was speaking plainly. It's no longer about parables or any kind of mysterious or hidden meetings. He's speaking plainly to them. This is what I'm about to do. Straightforward, okay? Get the story, get the picture. This is a third time, and, and this third time is the most detailed time, okay? He's talking about both the Jews, the, the religious leaders, the chief priests and the scribes, what they're gonna do, and then being handed over to the Gentiles. He's getting into detail here of what's going to happen, and then after three days, he will rise. And this is just shortly before they get into Jerusalem. So we're getting to the end of the story, as Mark tells us. Now, what's going on here? What, what are the disciples? How are they responding? And they were amazed, okay? They're freaking out about what's happening. Uh, they're amazed or astounded. It's not a word that happens very frequently, at least in the New Testament, in the gospel accounts. So it's a big word. It's a word that carries a lot of punch. They're coming up behind him, and there's a number of different emotions and reactions going on. Uh, it's, it's hard to describe, basically, is what's going on. They see him walking through Jerusalem. They've seen him now for almost three years. How do we make sense of this? This is an amazing, astounding thing to them. And then what are the rest of the people doing? What are the rest of them thinking? They're afraid. This doesn't feel like a victory procession, and we think it should. There's something about this that's scary, and I can't quite grab onto it. I can't put my finger on it exactly, but we're scared. We're not going into Jerusalem with high hopes and yay, rah stuff. And when you read chapter 11, everything seems like yay, rah, Paul, you know, it's not all that. Leading up to that, there is a wide mixture of, oh, we don't know what's happening. And it scares us. That's really what's going on. So if we can add to that real quickly, as far as context goes, last week we looked at the disciples saying to Jesus, right after this rich young guy, walks away from Jesus, and to be rich is, rich is to be blessed, and he walks away, and Jesus starts talking about a camel going through the eye of needle and how impossible that is, and an obvious reference to this guy that just walked away, and the disciples say, well, who can be saved? If he can't, he's the no-brainer. He's the perfect example of somebody. Look at this guy. He's got the credentials. Obviously, he's blessed by God. And he walks away. And if he can't be saved, well, then who can be? And then what does Jesus say? You remember? Uh, all things are possible with God. It's impossible with you. No matter what your credentials are, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And that leads us into what Jesus says here on the road that sounds really impossible, does it not? <laughs> I don't believe really what you're doing, Jesus, but we're going with anyway. We're freaked out, we're afraid, we're astounded, we're amazed, we don't know exactly how to take this, but we're going with you, at least for now, on the road to Jerusalem. Mark, in, as we hit the climax here, Mark is, is kind of like begging us to see something. That if you haven't seen it yet, or if you struggled this whole gospel, really grasping what's going on, I think this is shouting at us. See what's happening here. Don't be one that doesn't see. Finally begin to see and understand. So that's where we're heading here. What life looks like, and there's a contrast in these verses we're going to look at. And, and it's it just, it should reach out and grab us and shake us around and slap us around, which hopefully you'll do that without the actual physical slapping. But what life looks like on the one side when your eyes are on yourself, okay? What I'm looking at, thinking about is myself, contrasted with what does life look like in Christ when your eyes are on Jesus? That's where we're going. Let's read, shall we? Starting at verse 35. And James and John the sons of Zebedee came up to him. Remember, they're on their way to Jerusalem. They're, going, they're walking up on this path. They say to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. All right? And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. 
Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When your eyes are on yourself, we're going to look at James and John, the sons of thunder, as they're referred to in the Gospels. Don't know exactly what that means. Maybe they're loud. Maybe they're bombastic. Maybe they've got crazy kind of characteristics, personalities, whatever. But James and John come up to Jesus and ask what we might look at is an incredible question. So what does life look like when your eyes are on yourself? Number one, you use God. Or at least you tried to use God. What do they do? They come up to Jesus. We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Can you believe that? I mean, just take that at face value. They've been with Jesus for two, three years now. They've seen him do these amazing, miraculous things. Uh, They've been a part of all of that. They've been up close. They see him doing these things. And then they ask that. What kind of arrogance... What kind of ego do you need to come before the teacher, Jesus, and say, we want you to do whatever we ask of you? Who does that? So let's take that for a moment and think about it, okay? Because that kind of approach to Jesus is more common than you may think. In fact, it's pretty easy for all of us to be tempted into thinking that we can use Jesus to get whatever it is that we really want. So here's a couple very common ways that we try to use God for our own purposes. Here's the first one. See these all the time. I'm tempted by them all the time. Number one, uh, I look at Jesus and see in him my convenient Savior. That's one way I, and maybe you, are tempted to look at Jesus to try to use him. My convenient Savior. In other words, I'll go to you, Jesus, when I think I need you the most. Now, maybe that's dangling over the edge of a cliff, and the rope is there, and it's beginning to break, just like in the movies, and I'm about to fall to my peril, right? And that's when it, well, most of us are praying real hard, right? That would be real convenient, Lord, if you'd save me right now. And there's all sorts of moments like that that some of us have in life, but it's not necessarily the dangling over the cliff moment when we go to God or try to to use him in a way that's convenient. There's all sorts of times uh, that maybe I'm in trouble. Um, You know, I really would like to be saved from the impending F that I'm about to get on my report card right now. Uh, Lord, I'd really love you to provide the things that I want or need. My acne's really bad right now. I actually prayed about that, okay? In middle school, going into high school, I was just talking to a couple people this morning that middle school, going to high school, you're really all ugly anyway, just get over it. You just need to accept it because you don't look like the actors on TV and in the movies. No matter what you do, you're not gonna look like them. You're just ugly, (laughs) Okay, that doesn't sound very nice, but it's the way it is. I remember praying a lot, Lord, save me from what I look like. I don't want to be this anymore. Wouldn't it be convenient if Jesus answered that prayer to suddenly make me into somebody I'm not? Jesus, my convenient Savior, is a way that we can use or at least try to use Jesus. Here's another one that I see a lot. Uh, a convenient way, really, to, use, to try to use Jesus, to look at Jesus as my life coach. I go to Jesus for good ideas, good suggestions, and how to better live my life, how to be a better, moral, upstanding person, that he is the ultimate example of coaching skills, okay? To be a better parent, be a better spouse, be a better friend, be a better coworker, and so on. You get the point. Now, The gospel and even the New Testament as a whole does say 
that Jesus is our example, but it doesn't leave Jesus there. That's the key difference. You can't just say Jesus is a coach and use him to better yourself. He is our ultimate example, but he's so much more than just an example. Two ways that we begin to get into kind of a mode, a pattern of thinking, of living, that yeah, that Jesus, that God, you exist to somehow (laughs) do the things that I want as I want or as I feel like I need them. Now, even the Bible says that, well, Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, it says that God can't be mocked. God is no fool. God sees through those schemes, even if we don't personally see them clearly or understand them. So kind of keep that in mind when it comes to times where we're tempted to, to look at your relationship with God as, as something that can be used. Okay, so that's the first point. Let me look at the, let's talk about the second one for a little bit. Uh, When your eyes are on yourself, you're more tempted to try to maintain a status quo. Now, what in the world do I mean by that? We want to keep things, and it's just natural, uh, understandable and predictable and consistent. What's happening here in the account? They ask Jesus, you know, will you do whatever we ask of you? And then Jesus responds, what do you want me to do? And they said, grant us to sit, one at your right hand, and one of your left in your glory. They're asking for authority. They're asking for prominence. Why? Why do they come before Jesus and ask for those, those things? I think the answer is pretty simple. That's the way things have always worked. And not just in Jewish culture, but also in the Gentile and Roman Greek culture. Someone, when, uh, when the king takes his throne, Someone or a group of people are going to get the nod, right, to step forward, to be part of the court, to be a part of the political process. Somebody's going to get the nod to step up and have authority. The way that they are looking at what's happening on the way up to Jerusalem is simply that. And they've heard what Jesus says. They've heard what he's predicting about his near future. But for whatever reason, they're choosing to ignore the bad part. Now, I can't blame them for that either because everything that Jesus is saying goes against the status quo. Everything he's saying is brand spanking new and so hard to grasp that maybe, maybe they hear, as they hear Jesus speak, well, this is another parable. This is another thing, yeah, that uh, it's symbolic somehow. Who knows what they were talking about or how they're reasoning. I don't think they're stupid. I think they hear him but because they're so ingrained in one way of doing things, in one way of understanding things, that whatever Jesus says, it must be something different to fit in here. That when he talks about kingdom, it's got to fit in my understanding of kingdom. Little k. Little, you know, reducing it to where I'm at right now so that I don't have to be pushed beyond what I'm comfortable with. That's the status quo. That creeps in for not just the disciples, but with all of us. You hear something, you read something in Scripture, you hear Jesus saying something, okay, I've got to understand that in my terms. You get where I'm going? It's got to fit here, not in the bigger picture of what Jesus is talking about. But that's what Jesus is calling them into something that's going to shatter status quo, something that's going to push them beyond, far beyond, whatever they're comfortable with. Because even as Jesus says, you will be baptized with what I'm being going to be baptized with. They don't have a clue what he's talking about. The future, are you kidding me? If they knew it, they'd run the other direction. They'd run back to where they came from. Because that baptism is going to lead to death. It's going to lead to ultimate suffering and sacrifice for the kingdom. That's where Jesus is leading them, and they're walking along, okay, well, yeah, but you're still going to (laughs) rule. We still understand that that's how things happen. It can't really physically be death. Uh, That, you know, that's that's weird. It's it's bizarre. That doesn't happen, and most of us don't really understand or don't believe resurrection anyway. Uh, Once you're dead, you're dead. So it's got to be referring to something else. I'm certain that's what Mark is revealing to us here. We want Jesus' kingdom 
to fit into our kingdom, to maintain our status quo when our eyes are only looking at ourselves. One more thing. Create our own reality. What is going on there? So Jesus says, uh, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And what do they say to him? Yep, we're able. Mm-hmm. What happens? Now follow this kind of line of reasoning here. We're talking about using God to get what we want. If, if my eyes are on me, yep, there's got to be a way then. Maybe we don't think through it like this, but I'm going to push the example a little bit. If my eyes are really on me, then I'm going to see God and my relationship with him as a potential way to get more of really what I want. Okay? That's kind of my direction here. And I'm going to find a way then, as I read God's word, as I interact with it, I'm going to highlight those things that resonate with me, that I appreciate, that I respond to, that uh, this makes me feel good. And I'm going to fit that into my construct, my paradigm of what being a Christian really is, tuck it in there. And when you do that, what's the result? You create your own Christianity. I will see only what I want to see. I'll interact only with what makes me happy right now. And I kind of become delusional. (laughs) That sounds scary. But that's the path we go on. Really convincing, creepy cults come out of a progression like this that begins with you know, some understanding of who God is, but then it keeps drifting away from him and to the point where I focus only on myself and what I want and I push everything out that, doesn't, that I don't like that kind of bothers me a little bit. And you know what? The, what I find, what I think is really chilling is a whole lot of people, I think, are, are dangerously c- close to a cult-like experience and they don't realize it because they follow this progression and keep pushing Jesus further and further away to only get what I want. Well, but if I create my own reality, I can justify anything. And you've heard and seen examples of people who do that. So you've got some, you know, like you know, bad TV preachers or whatever, we've all seen examples of that, but then you get further and further away from that to really scary stuff. I find that there is a part of me still just just is so corrupted by sin that I can justify all sorts of things if it just keeps me happy and maintains my own status quo. That's the danger when my eyes are on me. These disciples, they're nice guys. I don't want to make them sound creepy. They're nice guys. The church is filled with nice guys. Guys that you would trust with your garage code, right? People that you'd hang around with, you spend a lot of good times with, right? Right? You can be a really nice religious person and completely miss the gospel, again, because your vision is stuck on you and what you want instead of what Christ wants. That's what I think Mark is screaming at us at this point of the journey. Where are your eyes? If your eyes are on yourself, you are dangerously close to leaving Jesus altogether. Now, what about if your eyes are on Jesus? And then Mark contrasts what's going on there with this awesome, beautiful exchange with Bartimaeus, starting at verse 46. And they came to Jericho... And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up. He is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, 
go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. When your eyes are on Jesus. Let's look at this brief interaction with Bartimaeus and Jesus. Number one, you begin to see without seeing or being able to see. You begin to see without being able to see. What in the world does that mean? Bartimaeus, he hears of Jesus of Nazareth coming, and what, he say, what does he say? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David. Now, he, that's not just any kind of random insertion there. He's not just Jesus of Nazareth. There's something different about this guy. He's not just another rabbi teacher. He knows, somehow we don't know his background or his influences or what he's been taught, but he knows he's not just another rabbi. He's the son of David. In that lineage, in that line, that leads us to believe that Bartimaeus knows there's something unique that maybe even that this guy is the Messiah. And he's heard he's coming, and he knows that he's passing by, and so he's crying out to Jesus, have mercy on me. When Jesus comes, you can see your need and what only he can provide. When Jesus comes by, that's the point where you begin seeing your need. We read this morning from Isaiah 42. Maybe Bartimaeus knew of that passage from the prophet Isaiah, speaking of the blind receiving their sight. Remember what we read this morning? All these things that that God tells to the prophet that are going, going to happen, that are miraculous, that aren't just about physically being able to see, that are about spiritually waking up from death and spiritually having eyes that see that a Messiah is coming to deliver his people. I love the language in in, in chapter 42. Go back and read it today. God says he cries out like a woman in childbirth. Do you remember that? He he makes this extreme language. He presents his case in extreme language. He's screaming out. The birth of something new is happening. Wake up. See it. See it with your eyes. That's what Bartimaeus is beginning to see while still being blind that the Messiah is coming, and there's hope that he has that as he responds, he cries out, mercy, mercy on me. And I don't think that as he cries it out, he's thinking just about his eyesight. I think he's in, in, clued in to what he desperately, completely needs. He's beginning to see without seeing, and then faith begins. He says, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Uh, Jesus asked, I'm going to say this later, I'm going to say it right now. He asked the same question to both groups. Did you notice that? The exact same question. And with this guy, he says, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. He just wants his eyes to work in this point of the story. All these things he could ask for, he asked for that one thing, his eyes to work. So Jesus, he says, uh, let me get back to the story here. Uh, Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 49, uh, 49, Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Now, Jesus makes him well. Verse 52, go your way, your faith has made you well. That word for made well and healed is the same word for being saved. And there is a reason that Mark leads us to that. That there is faith that has begun that has woken him up, and he doesn't just go from blind to seeing. He goes from spiritually dead to spiritually alive because Jesus says your faith has made you well. So where does faith begin exactly? That's what theologians love to argue about because he didn't say some sinner's prayer. He doesn't come to Jesus in a way that we like to think is acceptable. There's no formula here. You getting me? There's no formula response. There isn't in the Gospels. And that, there's a reason for that. When we reduce the Gospel to a formula, we think we're in control of it. Jesus never does that. He never tells the disciples there's a certain way that you talk to people and then you have them repeat after, them, or, you, know, after you and then we know for sure that they're a Christian because they said the right words. 
It's not there. It's not there anywhere in the Bible. And you know why? Because faith begins with Jesus. As Jesus sees him, or excuse me, as Jesus hears him calling out, what does he say? Or what does he do? Verse 49, Jesus stopped. Uh, Another way to translate that is Jesus stood still. I get goosebumps when I read this passage. As he and the disciples are walking by, here's this blind guy that everybody ignores. They're all on their way to Passover at Jerusalem and and worship at the temple. They've all got their things to do and, and, and busy, right? And who cares about that guy? He's got what's coming to him. He's blind and it's probably sin and his, his, and his family, whatever. Who cares, right? Blind guy, who cares? He's crying out, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus is walking along and he stops. What happens when God stops? And here's you. Maybe that's the moment where Bartimaeus comes alive. Maybe. Maybe that's when faith begins in his heart. And the other guy said, well, take heart. He's calling for you. We don't know why. We're busy. But he's, he's responding to you. Throws his cloak off, which if you're a blind beggar, that's the only thing you own. That's kind of a big deal. And I just wonder if Mark is getting into a little, little symbolism there, that as he comes to faith, he throws off the old life, and he comes to Jesus, and Jesus asks him the question, what, what do you want me to do? And he says, I want my sight. Jesus transforms Bartimaeus from blind beggar on the side of the road that no one cares about into someone entirely new and different that can see, that understands that faith has transformed him into a follower of Jesus Christ. Faith that does not lead to discipleship is not faith. Which brings us to our last one. You can see, if your eyes are on Jesus, you can see to follow him. Here's the cool, this is all cool. I just, I love this passage. Jesus then says, After he says, Rabbi, let me recover my sight, Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him along the way. We don't know, Bartimaeus, he's the only one or maybe the only one, or maybe there's two, I can't remember for sure, that that are healed that get a name in the Gospels. Another reason that Mark is saying, take note of this guy at this time right now. He's got a name. He stands out. Pay attention to what's happening here. Bartimaeus receives his sight And immediately, he follows him on the way. Jesus says, go your way. And what do you you think of when you read that? I could go do whatever. I got my sight back. I want to go see the lake. I want to go see my family I've never seen before. I'm going to maybe pick up a trade and enjoy life. And that's what a date looks like or, you know, whatever, right? You could do all sorts of things you could see now. He doesn't do any of that because his way becomes Jesus' way. Do you get it? He does go on his way because his way is now Jesus's. There is nothing else that compares, even though physically he can see because what's more important, he has faith to see with this. And he sees Jesus and nothing else matters. My way is now Jesus's way. There is for all of us who are called from from blindness to sight, There is no other way than Jesus and following him in discipleship. Do you get that? When you come alive, now my way is Jesus' way. Man, I just love this. So how does Jesus do this? Let's wrap this up here. How does he bring these two contrasting stories in Mark's account uh, from eyes on myself to eyes on Jesus and pursuing him and following him? How does he bring these two accounts together? Well, let's read that, verse 42. And Jesus called to them, meaning the disciples. So this is after that first account we read. And then they're starting to fight about the rest of the disciples here with James and John said, are you kidding me? You guys are jerks. What are you doing? Jesus hears the, the fight that's going on. He calls them together and says to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant. And whoever will be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Don't you get that yet? 
I don't, I don't see anger in his voice or in, this, in the context. I just see love pouring out on these guys that still keep looking at themselves. So Jesus confronts them with these words, and he does it in this way. Seeing in the way of Jesus means these three things. Jesus invites not only disciples, but all of us to share our desire with him. What do you want me to do for you is the question that echoes throughout time. It's not just for the disciples, not just for Bartimaeus. It's for all of us to answer. How do you answer? What is Jesus calling you to do? There is an undeniable voice, I believe, that when God speaks, you now we can ignore it, and we can choose to try to put it off, uh, try to go our own way in our own blindness, but as he speaks, you hear it, and then what do you say in response to it? That is what your future hinges on. What do you do with Jesus when he asks you that question? Now, Jesus already knows the answer. He knows us. He knows everything. But it's an open invitation for all of us to respond in the faith that only he gives. And don't look for mind-blowing, earth-shattering, earthquaking faith, whatever moment. Just look for the tiny little bit that says, I think you're it, and I'm going to choose it. Look for that. Keep this in mind. I don't have it on the screen. It's an anonymous quote. I don't know who said it. The kingdom of heaven is not for the well-meaning, but for the desperate. I love that quote. It brings us back to there's all sorts of ways we can make life work, right? There's all sorts of things we can really get caught up in when our eyes are on ourselves. That, but all of us have those moments, whether it's at night when everything's dark and silent, or maybe it's middle of the day. We all have those moments where, what is this really about anyway? Maybe you've had one recently where you're drawn to that, ah, that, uh, the obstacle, right? The wall. You hit it and go, what, what am I living for? If, if you could reduce all the other things, clear everything else away that clutters and it distracts, what is your life about? That can be a scary place to be in, right? What about Beck? He is on the side of Everest. He is sitting and waiting to die, and for whatever reason, he wakes up, and he has enough clearness of mind, even though he hasn't had oxygen for days, he has enough clearness of mind, I've got to get my half-frozen body up and, and, and walk out into the blizzard to try to live. He's not thinking about other th his financial portfolio. I, I don't think. I, I haven't interviewed him directly, but he's not thinking about what car he's going to buy when he gets home. He's not thinking about all these other things. He is struggling to move forward to find life. If you can take everything out of the picture just for a moment in your alone quiet time with God what is it really about and what gets you up the next day and is Jesus in that moment speaking to you then I plead with you respond to him because it's really not about you and how great your faith is it's how sufficient Jesus is for you Jesus invites, and he begins a whole new conversation. What does it say to the disciples? Verse 42, it shall not be so among you. Remember I said, you know, when your eyes are on yourself, it's about status quo. It's not. All these things that you think the kingdom of this world is about, well, yeah, that's what you're used to, but it is not my kingdom. All these ways of treating each other, all, all these ways of promoting yourself, the grabs for authority and power, that's, that's their mode. They're stuck in that. It's all they've ever known. Jesus says, no, that is not the way that my kingdom works. It can't be because I've come not to be served but to serve. Brothers and sisters, if there's anything that marks his church today, it's got to be having that same attitude. Like Philippians chapter 2. Have that same attitude that Christ had that you consider 
uh, your needs not as important as others. There is at least equally as important to you. Take on the attitude that Christ had, the giving up and giving to. That's what the church has to be marked with so the world sees it's not so among you that we follow Jesus Christ and that we give and that we love and that we serve out of a heart that's been changed. How does that heart change? Jesus pays the price to get us back so that we can be changed. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That word ransom means exactly what you think it means. It's to buy somebody back. If you are in prison, if you are in the bonds of slavery, if someone pays enough, you get free. That's what Jesus does. But not just bonds of sin, it's actual death. Where does Scripture lead us to? Let's look at Ephesians. I think I've got a slide here. Ephesians chapter 2. There we are. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. That's what it comes down to being made alive, Jesus on the cross pays the ransom that we could not pay and neither could anyone else to set us free. Jesus substitutes himself. He pays the debt that we could not pay by grace through faith as we respond. Everything that Mark leads us to, that's exactly what Jesus is saying to us this morning. It has to be in that same route. Jesus shows up. Jesus speaks into our life and says, it's me. Come back. Lord, have mercy on me. And he gives us eyes finally that can see him. And our way becomes his way. By grace, through faith, that's the ransom price that Jesus pays for us. Now, as we come to this table this morning, with the juice here and the bread here, When Jesus speaks of do this in remembrance of me, that's what we remember. That's what we celebrate. That's how we worship here this morning. So if you've been in a place in your life leading up even to this moment, maybe you've been a really nice guy, really nice gal, uh, and that's good. I like it. (laughs) I think it's a good thing you're nice. But you've never responded to Jesus. You've heard the voice, and you never said, yep, it's you. I accept what you've done for me by faith because of your great love and grace. I want to follow you. It it could be as simple as that. It's your word that's not mine. Make today the time that you make that clear with Jesus. And then this is yours because we all get to celebrate. It's not about if you're clean enough this morning. It's about what Jesus does to make you clean for eternity. The bread and the juice are just reminders of the celebration we have together. So keep that in mind. Before you come, uh, we'll sing some songs and worship. You have the opportunity to come up as as you want, as you feel free. Um, No one passes it to you. But come, you could take the the, cup of juice and a piece of bread here, or you can take it back to your seat. But make it a time that you remember, that you know that you've got Jesus, that what he did, he's done for you. Let's pray. Lord, I feel like this is a really holy moment. I, I just love your word. I love how it teaches and informs, and how I love how it just grabs us. Every one of us can fit into the sandals of Bartimaeus this morning. Every one of us can see you as not just another guy and what you teach is not just another self-help, good time, make it work, uh, success coach. We can see you because we've got a desperate need for a savior. That in that cold, empty, alone time, we realize that nothing else has worked. There's gotta be someone else. And Jesus, we recognize that it's you Only you have the ability to save us, to redeem us, to ransom us back to yourself, and to set us free in new life 
in a way so we can finally see you and what that life is really like. Lord, do that if we're still, or if we've still been rejecting or ignoring your voice. And then make this, Lord, an awesome celebration of who you are and what you've done. We remember you with our whole heart and mind and strength. In Jesus' name, amen.